The oil sands are basically oil mixed with sand and finer uh, materials which we generalize as clay uh, and in there is also water which is locked in so generally speaking it's a grain of sand surrounded by water surrounded by bitumen which is the oil. Now the really tough part about turning that resource into a business is that the oil is extremely viscous it's like peanut butter so it does not flow and separating it from the sand is a tremendous exercise which has kept it from becoming a business until the last 30 years. Probably the more significant number though is the amount of oil that is in the ground and this is where I think if Canadians had a bit of a sense of really how much it is they would stop and, and really pay attention to this because we view this as a national treasure and let me give you some numbers which are going to be hard to to sort of put in the context but there is 1.7 trillion barrels of bitumen in the ground and when they talk about the resource being the second largest to Saudi Arabia they are taking 10 percent of that number 175 billion barrels as being the second largest oil uh, recoverable oil deposit in the world next to Saudi Arabia so if in the fullness of time which I fully believe we will achieve to some degree our recovery of the oil is more than 10 percent than what is there we become very quickly the largest resource in the world. You know, how will Canada be oil self-sufficient if it does not continue to exploit the oil sands? Uh, the conventional resource base in this country is 3% of the oil that we have. The other 97% is all oil sands. And currently, we extract a lot more conventional oil relative to its resource and that's why it's in declining and in fact uh, will sort of just decline away into the future uh, where the oil sands uh, is expected to grow as we continue to invest. Uh, we produce about one and a half million barrels of conventional oil today and about one and a half million barrels of oil sands oil and that gets mixed in the whole uh, consumption of what we use here in Canada as well as what we export to the United States. We use about half and export about half. Specific projects, take Syncrude for example, at today's production rate, the leases that we have would allow us to produce oil at 350,000 barrels a day for a hundred years. There are quite a number of leases which have not been exploited yet and may not be exploited for several decades. So the hundred year life really depends on when we will start to go after some of the other resource. So, Think about it as you know, two or three centuries of economic oil production out of the oil sands. There's basically two processes here. One is, is I call extraction, or the industry calls extraction. That's where you separate the oil from that water and sand. And that's done by basically physical agitation and hot water. So it's a fairly simple process, but it has to be done in very, very large scale. Of course, we recycle the water and try to get very energy efficient to minimize our CO2. Uh, emissions because CO2 emissions is all about how much energy you use and the technology of that extraction has improved to the point where we have reduced the CO2 per barrel by almost 40 percent since 1990. So technology continues to make it a, a more and more environmentally attractive fuel as oil from around the world gets heavier and heavier and starts to face the same challenges that we have in, in the energy intensity of refining it. So now that you've separated the bitumen from the sand, you have to convert this tar-like substance into something like gasoline or jet fuel or diesel. And the way you do that is a very conventional refining method, uh, either coking or hydrocracking. And, and this is what all oils around the world go through to be converted into finished products that we get at the pump. On climate change, it's all about CO2 emissions, and CO2 emissions is all about energy intensity. So I, I mentioned we, through technology, want to reduce our energy intensity, and we've always done that because we've been commercially motivated to do it. Energy intensity costs money. Uh, it's only in the last five years have people started to focus on CO2, but frankly, we've been doing it since we started. So that is sort of a, a nice trend of improvement, and we will continue to do that as we continue to apply science. In fact. We have one of the largest pure research and development centers. We spend $50 million a year on that effort, and that is growing because more and more of that effort is being environmentally uh, motivated by, uh, by us. We use about 2 
barrels of water uh, for every barrel of oil that we produce. It's not a bad ratio. It used to be much, much greater than that. But the reason why we don't use that much water is that we continue to recycle the water that we have uh, on a continual basis. So 88% of the water at Syncrude, for example, is recycled water from our tailings ponds. And that's the main function of the tailings ponds. The tailings ponds have had a lot of nasty things said about them, but they're really part of the process in containing and cleaning water. We send processed water to the tailing spawn, that's where the sand falls out, the clays go to a lower level in the ponds, and then it leaves clarified water that we can continue to use. So from the river, the industry draws about 1% of the average annual flow to produce the oil that we get today from the oil sands, 1%. And the Alberta government, since day one, has limited the allocation of water to our industry to 3%. So we work very hard to stay uh, obviously inside that window because that limits what we will eventually be able to do. Now just to put some comparison to those types of numbers, the Athabasca River being as far north as it is, is very underutilized. You get down into the populated areas of Alberta, the South Saskatchewan which runs through the province is allocated to agriculture, municipalities and industry to the extent of 50% of its flow. 50%, yeah, no, it's huge. Uh, not all of that is used in that allocation, but most of it is. And the Bow River, which runs through Calgary, is, is allocated to an even larger extent, north of 75% of its flow. It's, it's a resource that we have to be careful of. And given that Canada has the most water, we have to be more careful because its abundance maybe sometimes makes us a little uh, less stringent than we should be. But in the oil sands, it is a focus of our business. Water is something that we use very, very carefully. And in fact, outside of the mining part of the business, the in situ recovery, this is where we recover bitumen through drilling wells and injecting steam. They virtually don't use any fresh water. They drill down deeper and get brackish formation water, which is essentially salt water, and they process that to generate their steam. So they don't use any river water. And that's where most of the resource will come from in the fullness of time. It is uh, not attractive, but it's the same as any other mining operations, just that nobody focuses on metal mining. Uh, there are open pit mines for copper, lead, zinc all over the world, and even bigger mines for coal and phosphate fertilizers uh, in Florida, for example. But, you know, the attention has not been brought to them by the environmentalists. The attention all seems to be focused on our industry, which I find actually quite curious because think about the CO2 emissions from the oil sands. If you look at Canada, the oil sands, the entire industry represents 2% or sorry, 5% of Canada's CO2 footprint. Most of the footprint in Canada comes from, you know, consumption of hydrocarbons to fuel and heat our homes and agriculture and industry. The oil sands industry is only 5%. Now Canada as a country is only 2% of global emissions. So when you look at Canada, as the size and, and the oil industry, you multiply those 2% times 5%, the oil sands is one one thousandth of the CO2 emissions of the world. You could shut us all down and it wouldn't make one iota of difference to, you know, materiality of CO2 emissions globally. So again, why the focus is on us, I think is to your point, is because the open pit mines create very dramatic photography and it sells very well when you are a fundraiser. First of all, there's continued studies uh, by many, and, and I think the, the most credible uh, source is Cambridge Energy Research, which is a big American think tank, and oil from a mining operation in the oil sands is about 6%, only 6% more intensive than the average oil that is consumed in the U.S., which is by and large imported from all over the world. So the U.S. basket of imported oil uh, is only 6% on average less intensive than the oil that we produce from the Syncrude mines, for example. So it's quite comparable, if you will. Um, the other point to bear in mind is no matter where the oil comes from, the CO2 intensity, and this is basically industry consumes a part of the barrel to extract it and refine it. They generally burn that barrel to generate their energy to, to do all the work. Uh, so the very best, lightest, sweetest oil uh, consumes about 6 or 7% of the barrel to, 
to deliver that to the market as a refined product and, and the very worst, heaviest oil that is the most energy intensive uh, might consume 20% of the barrel to finish that product and bring it to market. So the end result is that at least 80% of the barrel of oil gets turned into CO2 by you and me, the consumer, when we burn it in our car. You know, most of our critics are from outside the country. Uh, Canadians' vested interest in the oil sands is huge and people don't appreciate it. They are very big and I think people are starting to get that sense. We're a big, big part of GDP. We're a huge part of exports for Canada. We generate a tremendous amount of royalties and taxes and balance of trades in, in, in our exports. And that's all good because it goes to the governments and, and, and they turn it into health spending, education spending, so on and so forth. Now, that money is spread through the country on the tax basis, but it's also spread through in jobs. We have a lot of jobs in Fort McMurray where the work takes place, but there's a tremendous amount of equipment uh, and uh, products that have to be brought to Northern Alberta to do this work. And those products come from all across Canada. And therefore, we're creating jobs all across the country. There was a, a, a research piece just finished less than a year ago by Canadian Energy Research Institute. And it forecasts that over the next 25 years, the oil sands will inject $1.7 trillion, again, a difficult number to put your head around, into the Canadian economy. $1.7 trillion is equivalent to about 500,000 jobs per year for the next 25 years. The ability to actually generate that kind of resource in a friendly democracy like ours that respects human rights, does share the economic benefits across its population, and applies the very best practices and technologies available in the world in terms of the environmental uh, approach to developing the product is really the best thing going. I think Canadians are very, very fortunate to be at the helm of this, of this type of project, which is going to be around for centuries, as I mentioned. It's very clear to me this resource is a national treasure, and I can point to nothing else that's quite as big, uh, you know, except perhaps our water resource in terms of generating hydroelectricity. This is the order of magnitude that we have, and our critics are mostly from outside of Canada, so I think Canadians should be wary about the information that gets dispersed in the media. Uh, some of it is factual, a lot of it is exaggerated, and some of it is actually not factual. And we're on the road, I'm trying to give the industry's perspective, which I think is very factual. We are scrutiny, scrutinized by um, you know, the governments and the securities commissions because we're a public company. So I'd like to think that people appreciate what we say is true because uh, we can be verified. Uh, a lot of uh, the end goals are not verifiable and I think that's very unfortunate. And their motivations uh, presumably are about the environment, but remember they're also very much about fundraising, so uh, not entirely pure in terms of their own motivations. We're about profit, of course, there's no question about that, but we're very transparent in what we do. And again, that's why we're out speaking to the public to tell people what we do. We're totally open about it and we will continue to do this now. This has become part of our business, the communication component. But what Canadians need to realize is that this is their asset. If it was sitting in any other country, people would be, you know, having a parade. It would be a very raw, raw event for this asset to be sitting in a country like the United States. Canadians are a different kind of people, you know. It sits here in Canada and we're a bit ambivalent about you know, should we be proud or should we be ashamed? I'm here to tell you, you should be very, very proud. This is a national treasure. We should take advantage of it in the best environmentally uh, benign method that we can do, which is exactly what our industry has been doing for years, and uh, make the best of it. Uh, and uh, again, take all the information that you receive as a Canadian and think about it for a minute. And there are websites with tremendous amounts of facts that can be obtained now on the internet, it's fantastic and I would encourage Canadians to get educated about it because this is a very, very important topic to us.